institution which sought to empower working people by providing them with relevant learning opportunities. But as we have observed developments at the national, regional, and international level, we have concluded that the demands for equity and social justice requires us to rapidly ramp up our research capacity. prepared to champion the college's work in this direction. This afternoon, we do not only launch Up and Marlon's new book, but we also launch our new quarterly journal, The Social Justice Forum. And just this past week, we issued a call for papers for a new book that will also be edited by Dr. Anatole and Dr. Curtin. This is exciting. These are exciting times for us here at the college. And I thank you all for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry, and for sharing with us the exciting events that will be taking place to come as well. Thank you. I am told that our program is to run at a clip. So without uh, taking up any more time, I invite you to Come, the Minister of Labour, the Honourable Stephen McCletchy, to bring us greetings. Minister. Thank you, Madam, uh, Dr. Henry, our authors, Dr. Edgehill, representatives from Panama, Cuba, and the and Colombia. I welcome you all today on this book launch. Let me start off by saying how happy I am to be here. I have had a number of discussions with regards to the Cipriani College of Labor and its academic endeavor and the fact that we need to move and position the college not only nationally, but regionally and indeed internationally. To do so, we have a, a couple imperatives that we must, and one of those is academic excellence and many tertiary education institutions are in fact, how should I say, they set themselves apart by the work that the lecturers and faculty do in terms of pure research and publishing. So this is a step in the right direction. I encourage others to follow in that particular footstep. And when I looked at what was on offer in terms of the book, I was drawn to, and uh, it seems like it have no connection, but in my mind it does, in that I am a sci-fi buff. I watch everything from Stargate, Star Trek, to you name it, I've seen it 10 times. And recently, Amazon um, aired, not Amazon actually, it was Disney, aired a show called What If? And What If? was premised on all the other Marvel movies, and they took each movie and took something from it and asked the question, what if? What if something else happened, then what? And for me, as an academic institution, we need to keep asking ourselves, what if? And if we ask ourselves continuously, what if? then it might lead to then something. And so the what if for me is what's next? What can we encourage? How can we create the environment, not just for faculty members, but for students to get involved 
in research and and um, because you know in Trinidad and Tobago we, we talk a lot but we have very little data to support what we talk about and our source of truth which is the um the institution that always gives us information a year after and two years after um what's that institution i have a brain freeze here um the central statistical office and for me there is lots of room that um, and a lot of space that we can enter and start doing some of that research particularly in labor and so on but enough of my rambling and maybe i i need to tip my hat to raymond mark Curtin and marlon anatol for the work that they have brought before us today, which is contemporary issues in Caribbean and Latin American relations. I also want to thank all those people who would have contributed to this book and who would have taken the, the idea of what if we did things differently, how would the world look? How would Trinidad and Tobago look? How would the Caribbean look? How would, in fact, the universe look? And I'm sure that by asking that question, we go on and to find ways and deal with the issues that are relevant and which the book tried to find some kind of direction. So I note I have not read the book as yet, I will. Um, but in preparing for these few remarks, I actually went and found the book on Google Books and in, I believe it's Amazon or some other site. And they did in fact give a rundown of what the topics were and what the insights that they were trying to achieve. I note that the authors come from many different territories, and while they share passion for regional integration, their academic and professional experiences place them in a unique space. And that space allows them to evaluate policy making in the region and to, have ad and to take advantage of the empirical research that supports their conclusions. While the issues here are numerous, they are all relevant and all contemporary. And the value of this publication is that it is not influenced by any one perspective, paradigm, or school of thought, but represents individual thinkers who have arrived at their positions based on empirical research, which has been influenced by deficiencies in the system of both governments and operations in the region. So I would have a lot more to say and to maybe pen when I do read the book in its entirety, but let us not lose, and I don't know how many people here have read the book. Let me see my show of hands, if any. All right, so, right, so it's, it's going to get there and we're all going to celebrate it. So what do I do in this particular case? I ask you to consider always the what if, encourage other academic staff to let their voices be heard for a better Trinidad and Tobago, a better Caribbean and a better world. And I thank you and I thank you gentlemen for the work that you have done. Thank you very much, Minister. And as a marvel, I've seen all of what if, and yes, what if we put our energies towards improving the issues in Latin America and the Caribbean? That would be amazing. Let me take a moment to recognize the arrival of Ambassador, Her Excellency, Sylvia Palmer Miller, Ambassador of the Republic of Panama, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, Joya Castillo, 
Wonderful, the Charge de Fer at the Embassy of Panama. Welcome. At this point in our proceedings, I ask us to take a few minutes to be open to the comments and observations which will be brought to us now by Dr. Mark Kujan. Madam Chair, Honorable Minister, Government, Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Edgel, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen all. I join my colleagues to say welcome, bienvenidos, Benvindo, welcome. If I can use the language of youth and say big up to the youths in the present here. And dream. Let me take this opportunity to thank and congratulate the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies for, partners, for partnering with us, the editors and contributors to this publication in this activity and for hosting this event. I applaud the vision of the leadership of the college who have committed to the of the working people and the enhancement of their capacity and consciousness in relation to domestic, regional, and international issues which impact the life of the working class. I'm profoundly grateful also to my co my co-editor and for his contribution. And I mentioned here the work of Dr. Marlon Anatol and for the collaborative engagement of the contributors to this publication, the contemporary issues on Caribbean and Latin American relations, which was published by Lexington Books, a part of the Roman and Littlefield Publishing Group. I also want to thank personally Dr. Ruben Martoreggio of Suriname, Dr. Clement Henry of Guyana, Amanda Altol, and Dr. Sasha Joseph Matthews of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Kian Skeet of Barbados, and Dr. Jacqueline LaGuardia and Milagros Martinez of Cuba. They all produced results of evidence-based research on issues of significant importance to the region. And these include the impact of the Venezuelan crisis on small states of the region, including the challenges of migration management and the options available to reducing the barriers to asylum in a complex regional environment. The studies also focused on the importance of citizen security in an era of increased transnational organized crime, as well as the increasing engagement with Cuba, especially in the areas of climate change, disaster management, health, and education. After 50 years of sustained engagement between Cuba and CARICOM. The research also focused on the assessment of the recent developments in the oil and gas sector in the Guyana Shield especially in relation to the movement towards greater collaboration among South American states, especially Guyana, Suriname, in the Guyana Shield, and also the countries Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela. Additionally, the range of articles, including analyses related to social policy issues, which were initiated in the South American Regional Cooperation Agreement and Arrangement, in UNASUR and the potential applicability to states of the wider region. 
I also think that of, equal, of equal significance was the study on the strengthening of the CARICOM's trade and economic strategies and the options available to build new bridges of cooperation through expanded membership opportunities in that organization. One could also argue that it's significant to note that in the midst of a pandemic, which has impacted the Caribbean and Latin America, both the young and experienced academics and professionals devoted significant energy to research in effort to ensure the advancement of data-driven inquiry into issues which impact both the Caribbean and Latin America, and at the same time, provide areas for consideration by policymakers in the quest for improvement of the quality of life of the people of the region. In my respectful view, we in the Caribbean must continue to focus on research and to identify and analyze unambiguously the range of issues that continues to negatively impact the lives of people in the Caribbean small states. We must interrogate those issues without fear of criticism. We must analyze in a reliable and objective manner and advance understanding for the good of our region and the global community. It has become apparent that the changing global and regional socioeconomic and political environment have brought new challenges, including a retreat from the regional integration efforts, which characterized the beginning of the 21st century, new threats to public safety, environmental concerns, rising unemployment, especially among youth, challenges of the pandemic and post-pandemic economies, which all demand sustained research, dialogue, and the articulation of options for consideration by our governments and policymakers. It must also be noted that traditionally, there's been significant limitation to Caribbean Latin American collaboration. And these have been sometimes alluded, caused by linguistic and cultural differences, limited trade and commercial exchanges, differences in size and resource endowment, different colonial experiences, among other constraints. We have noted, however, that in the 21st century, there's been a shift as convergences of interest have emerged, deriving from similar challenges and prospects from both sets of states. These new integration arrangements have allowed the Caribbean Latin American interaction at several fora. The Association of Caribbean States, an organization which began or which was birthed in the thinking of the West Indian Commission, the Community of Latin American States, UNASUR, the ALBA, the Central American Integration System, among others, which allowed for the promotion of increased understanding, the building of trust, and the provision of new arrangements for mutual benefit. Additionally, we have recognized that the Caribbean community in Latin America must continue to in engage collectively in order to enhance regional collaboration and confront issues that pose a common threat. It cannot, we cannot continue to have a case of the distant cousin relationship between the two sets of states, but there must be an understanding of the need for collective responsibilities in these important areas. And I believe that the academic communities of both the Caribbean and Latin America have a responsibility to present the kind of research and for consideration, the kind of policies which could be utilized in favor of all of the region and the academic community and the professionals in our midst have, I think, must assume that role. And I would encourage the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies to come to the forefront and join us in this activity. Madam Chair, I wish to implore young academics and professionals to continue to contribute to the development of scholarly literature, and indeed to reiterate my view that they must provide policymakers and the wider audience with analysis of their problems and prospects 
for a region. And it is my sincere hope that this book, which provides a new body of literature, will inspire or influence future research and publication on these issues and others, and those which may arise in the future. I thank you. Muchas gracias. Muito obrigado. Thank you well. And I trust that the great architect of the universe will continue to guide us during the rest of these proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Curtin, for sharing with us some of the historic perspective of relations between the two states what is happening now and sharing a vision for young academics and professionals to move forward in improving relations between the two states. Thank you so much. At this point, I would like to invite a gentleman to share his wealth of knowledge and experience with us. Let us welcome our keynote experience, His Excellency, Dr. David Edgell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The Honorable Stephen McClashey, Cabinet Minister in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, of Labour, is it? Yeah. Her Excellency, Marta Cecilia Pinuro Perdomo, Ambassador of the Republic of Panama. Doctors Andrew Vincent Henry, Mark Curtin, Marlon Anatol, Director of the Cipriani College of Labor Studies and co-editors of the publication. The distinguished I.D. Cortez Acosta, Charge d'Affaires of the Embassy of the Republic of Colombia in Trinidad and Tobago other representatives of diplomatic missions resident in Port of Spain, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, brothers and sisters all, or should I say sisters and brothers all. I feel challenged to follow Dr. Curtin's overview, which came across as quite hopeful like him, I hold hope for the future of the relationship between Latin America and the Caribbean. However, I only hope that after my presentation, it doesn't put a damper on the spirit of hope that he is inspired with his intervention. After yanking me out of a much long for contentment of my retirement, the organizers of this event bestowed on me the undeserved honor of presenting these brief remarks to this August gathering. The launch of the publication, Contemporary Issues in Latin Caribbean and Latin America Relations. If I am to be brutally honest, and I usually am, my friend Dr. Henry will tell you. And all things considered, given our current reality, I must admit to you that the jury is still out on whether I should thank them for the invitation or bemoan their approach to me. The foregoing apart though, I preface my intervention by affirming 
that the remarks which I'm about to present will likely reflect the bias of a career diplomat, a career practitioner who spent almost all of his professional life, some three and a half decades, as a diplomat in the service of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. As a result, the views expressed may more closely resemble the ramblings of a cynic rather than reflect the rigor usually associated with academic research. In short, it is not my intention, indeed not my place, nor am I qualified to engage in an analysis of the merits of the various essays contained in the publication. Instead, I limit myself to airing some broader, maybe arguably controversial perspectives gleaned from having witnessed firsthand a not insignificant range of deliberations relevant to the subject area. All of the above notwithstanding, and having <clears throat> perused the content of the publication, the subject of today's launch, there can be no doubt that the issues covered therein are as timely as they are relevant. And it is my sincere hope that the value of the research perspectives and insights expressed therein would have an impact well beyond the value purely as a reference text for academics. There are, in my view, too many gaps in understanding among the majority of the body politic of our societies that must be bridged if the citizenry is to serve as an effective conduit and catalyst for the introduction of new ideas and perspectives into the process of policy formulation and implementation. I feel strongly that the real value add of a publication such as this should be assessed additionally against the extent to which its content is able to sensitize and nurture consciousness and understanding among the majority, so as not to render the subject matter the domain of a selected minority bordering on the esoteric. Yes, I'm aware that in our evolving societies, the structures do not exist, and where they do, they are too few to undertake the challenge as I have laid it out a challenge which likely lies beyond the remit of the academic and research community. Yet I hold firmly that unless we are able to establish the intellectual linkages, think tanks, public colloquia, the fourth estate, high school curricula, etc., to foster the flow of new, objective, and non-partisan ideas, and perspectives into the process of public education and governance. The value of the scholastic offerings, such as those contained in this publication, may be deemed the mere fulfillment of individual academic ambition and endeavor. In essence, I posit that the determination of the national interest of any of our countries on any given issue should not be the exclusive remit of the victors in a political contest. The literature covering the evolution of Caribbean-Latin America relations is extensive. Professor Emeritus Anthony Bryan, Henry Gill, Andre Serbing, our own Dr. Mark Curtin, Montout Maida, Mills and Lewis, among many others, have provided analytical insights over the years that provide the required basis for understanding what appears to be contra inherent contradictions in the Caribbean-Latin America relationship. Dr. Curtin, in the introduction to his excellent piece on the Guyana Shield subregion, notes that, and I quote, the discourse with respect to relations between Caribbean and Latin American states traditionally centered 
around the sense of separateness and economic and cultural distance, which have constrained the emergence of strong and sustained linkages. Several arguments have been advanced, including the view that the impact of bilateral colonialism, which include political, economic, and social dimensions, as well as linguistic and cultural differences, all which serve to limit the development of these linkages. Continuing, he references Mills and Lewis, who note that, and I quote, the lengthy periods of the political and economic relationship with Europe, the extreme dependence of the small countries of the Caribbean on those relations for their viability, and the cultural and educational impact of the relationship have not traditionally disposed the peoples of these countries to think of themselves as being part of the American continental zone. Gill agrees, noting that the Caribbean and Latin America appear to constitute two separate worlds, which took no notice of each other in spite of their proximity. Similarly, Sanders asserts that, in short, small Caribbean states and the larger Latin American territories share little more than the same geographical region, and their relationship is not mutually supportive. For her part, Montout affirms that, and I paraphrase, that at the heart of this seeming dissociation into Ilya was a post-colonial arrangement which had impacts at the political, economic, social, linguistic, and cultural levels, which effectively hindered collaboration. Citing Brian, she identifies other factors causing divisions such as tense race and cultural relations and that is an important thing that is not well known in our English-speaking society. And discriminatory immigration laws towards Blacks, coupled with distinct experiences in their respective routes to the attainment of political independence. This state of affairs continued into the immediate post-independence period for Commonwealth Caribbean states. Notwithstanding the incipient signs of common ground for mutual understanding, particularly with the entry of the newly independent Caribbean states into regional and international organizations. For his part, Mayra asserts that the Caribbean began to see Latin America as a possible alternative after 1963. This is over five decades ago, when it became difficult for citizens of the English-speaking Caribbean to enter the UK, as well as a source of economic assistance, as preferences decrease from the UK. The initial attempt by the English-speaking Caribbean to interact with Latin America was not welcomed. Some of this played off in the OAS, as the Latins resisted Caribbean states' membership and participation in the OAS. Myra notes additionally that this new space on also highlighted the differences between them in terms of economic and social structures, cultural and language differences, as well as differences in population and physical size. In my own experience, many colleague Latin American diplomats who had pains to fully grasp the nuances and interplay of independence, monarchy, and republicanism of the Caribbean states, all within the construct, construct of a British Commonwealth. Myra further notes that these differences in history and political structure led to tensions and competition, not to mention the coming into prominence of two major border disputes involving Caribbean and Latin American states. It is not unlikely that these factors reinforce the propensity of the newly independent Caribbean states to hold on to their linkages with Europe through the preferal, preferential arrangements of Lume and its successor agreements, as well as the concessionary, concessionary agreements negotiated with the USA subsequently, to the detriment of a more meaningful and sustainable relationship with their Latin American neighbors. 
the emerging major forums for the potential engagement of Car the Caribbean and Latin America, who of course, the United Nations through the Latin America and Caribbean group, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the Non-Aligned Movement, the group of 77 plus China, the Organization of American States, as I've mentioned earlier, and of more recent vintage, the Latin American Economic System, CELA, the Rio Group, the Association of Caribbean States, and the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC. This latest, the success of the Rio Group and the Latin American and Caribbean Summit on Integration and Development, which was created ostensibly to deepen Latin American and Caribbean integration and to reduce the insignificant influence of the United States on the politics and economics of Latin America. Also coming into being was a plethora of continental sub-regional groupings, which excluded the island states of the Commonwealth Caribbean. I would be remiss if I did not point out also that Caribbean states' relations with the non-English speaking island states of the Caribbean are worthy of separate mention and examination, and that the views outlined here may not necessarily conform to the findings of such an examination. From the outside looking in, one may be tempted to view the proliferation of these forums as a positive indication that the two regions were advancing towards the common cause of identifying issues and objectives of mutual interest and devising strategies for the achievement of same. On the inside, one bore witness, however, to the expenditure of scarce resources, human and financial, in servicing these forums without the attendant gains nor value add. Many reasons have been proffered to explain why these theaters of engagement have never lived up to their potential, nor fulfilled the lofty ideals which were articulated when they were first launched. Among them, differences in political orientation, asymmetries of size, race relations, culture, and language, leading to an almost innate mistrust. It is my assertion that at the center of it all, was a reticence on the part of the larger Latin American states to view and to deal with its much smaller Caribbean counterparts as equals in the process of deliberation and negotiation, as well as insularity, which saw individual countries insisting on at times controversial national positions, which had the effect of hindering consensus rather than promoting discussion of mutually beneficial outcomes. I recall the comment to me of a colleague of an important ASEAN state a decade or so ago, that it appeared that the Latin American and Caribbean countries preferred to emphasize their differences rather than build on their commonalities. A poignant observation, if ever there was one. Of course, there were marginal gains along the way. But how do we explain the continued foundering of such organizations as CELA, the Latin American Economic System, over four and a half decades of existence with precious little to show? Even participation today at its annual ruling ministerial council sessions is left in major part to resident ambassadors evincing a lack of the requisite political will to generate effective and relevant outcomes at the leadership level. For the ACS, the Association of Caribbean States, emerging in the mid nineties out of the recommendations of eminent Caribbean intellectuals with heady objectives in the very relevant areas of trade transport and tourism. Its core mandates, yet still struggling to find its way, and a mere decade ago, tottering on the brink of a complete disbanding. And the CELAC, sorry, an ECLAC, 
the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, whose work program over the years accommodating research on the Caribbean almost as an afterthought. I guess reflecting the manner in which this sub-regional grouping came to be included in its membership. Being out of that loop for several years now, I am, I am unable to say whether any meaningful change has been wrought on this score. I have my suspicions though that it has not. Additionally, the dynamic of CELAC's deliberations has been questionable from the outset. Emerging on the crest of the pink tide movement in Latin America and created to balance political, economic, social, and cultural diversity of Latin America and the Caribbean of some 650 million people, discussions quickly descended into the exploitation of the forum which purported to represent the interests of hemispheric states, excluding the US and Canada, to garner support for country positions to be aired in wider international fora. Unable to cope with the sheer burden, both human resource and financial, of servicing the organization's thematic forums, Caribbean countries were often swept along with the tide into adopting positions that were not necessarily in accord with their own national positions vis-a-vis -vis third countries. There often appeared to be an agenda beyond the meeting's agenda. With few sustainable gains to show, and with its founding leadership no longer present, and the political orientation of individual countries swaying between progressive and neoconservative, it is small wonder that the very integrity of the organization is under threat, as evidenced by the very recent withdrawal of a major player. In a political, a political context in which we are witnessing a crisscrossing of alliances, reminiscent of the Cold War, the daunting specter of creeping authoritarianism and democratic values under siege the introduction of non-traditional players into the regional arena as a result of the pursuit of insular national interests by individual countries without re reference to the collective interests. All at a time, when Caribbean countries face the existen existential threats posed by environmental, health and security issues, when the very concept of truth seems up for debate, when our traditional partners and interlocutors of trust by their very acts appear no long, to be no longer worthy of that trust. Our countries will be well advised to make such issues as I have, been, as I have outlined, a more integral part of the national debate. In this regard, efforts need to be redoubled to ensure that the institutionality of Commonwealth Caribbean foreign policy coordination is reinforced. The anomaly of countries classified as high and middle income, yet daily facing the viability and sustainability of their very existence must be addressed head on. One of the basic pillars of the integration movement regarding said coordination, for long the source of solidarity and strength in multilateral fora, has been shown to be vulnerable and even susceptible to be treated individually as a commodity to the detriment of the whole. In pursuit of their own survival, individual countries embark upon actions which undermine the very essence of the integration movement. The history of recent decades is replete with examples. It is against this backdrop that I assess the value of works such as the one we launched here today. The cross-border issues, such as the unprecedented migration phenomenon of recent years, as instances of xenophobia in destination countries have raised concern, very cause for concern, and have brought into stark focus the fragility of the much vaunted Latin solidarity. Concerted action in the content, in the context of our integration 
and other collective arrangements are under threat as country relations are subjected to considerations of ideology and extra regional alliances of any given political party in power. And these institutions have now become arenas of conflict rather than collaboration. The emerging picture appears to be one of chaos and not propitious to foster in cooperative endeavor. Much work remains to be done. In closing, I again commend for study the compilation of studies in this present publication as a valuable contribution contribution to the understanding of Caribbean relations with Latin America, but hasten to re-emphasize that its red value add should be the extent to which it factors into engendering consciousness in the public in general as a necessary input into the process of improved governance and policy formulation, prerequisite of an effective democracy. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your contribution. It was certainly sobering, and I, as somebody sitting on the outside looking in, uh, I still see a spark of hope because Ambassador's lived experience is something real. And when you're moving forward, it helps to build off of realities. So thank you again for sharing your experience with us today. At this point, last but not least, let me invite to the podium to present some closing remarks, one of the editors, Dr. Marlon Anatol. Good afternoon, Director, Honorable Minister, members of the Diplomatic Corps, friends, colleagues, guests, those here and those who follow us on live stream. I will close off by just making some basic remarks about some of the work that has been done as well as some of the research which is pretty exciting, which is happening here at the college. So I thank again those who spoke before me who laid the foundation for my closing remarks. At the college, we've been basically blessed. Um, we've been able to do a lot of work in a relatively short period of time on the directorship of the director. Then we have the Deputy Dean, Academic Affairs, Mr. Salino, we have the heads of departments and the whole team, all of us who work together to ensure that um, the research that we do is data-driven and it is sound and is open to criticism. And of course, a lot of it being done through the Elmer Francois Research Institute here. The staff here, what we do is we work on conceptualizing what we do, but also the operationalizing. Even a simple event like today, took a lot of coordination. And I'm, again, I'm glad to see you know people here, even under the conditions of COVID and uh, the hesitancy that we have in being in public places. Historically, the college has engaged in national and regional stakeholders in all different sorts of activities. But the new direction is to get more involved with robust and critical research that fundamentally will benefit the region as well as all our other national stakeholders. With the college's mandate or research agenda, we are increasingly engaging in conversation with our stakeholders, again, nationally, regionally, but also we're doing a lot of partnerships with international agencies, um, international institutions that are dedicated also to research. We are concerned primarily with issues that impact our lives, the livelihood of people and the lives of workers. So we're looking at issues uh, inclusive, but not limited to things like meaningful and decent work, fair work, equity, justice, social dialogue, um, and looking at the critical evaluation of cooperatives, labor movements and how they contribute to the betterment of our people nationally and regionally. Through 
the work of all our colleagues, we have been able to do a lot more work on social dialogue and conversations with our people. And it's not limited to any one perspective, as was said, I believe, by uh, my former speakers, where we look at the new voices, the perspectives, the opinions on what matters, what makes us who we are, and how do we do what we do better for national again and regional development. It's all about open dialogue. It could be in the form of workshops, conferences, meetings, writings, dialogue. Again, as some of my former uh, colleagues and, and former speakers said, a lot of what we do is based on guesswork, it's not based on robust um, research, but also we tend to be making the same mistakes all the time. And I think to a large extent is because there's not enough dialogue between ourselves and our stakeholders. To date, there are four different uh, research activities going on at the college. One is the Buzz newsletter, which comes out of the Edmar Francois Institute. There is the Guardian newspaper column that we have weekly, which is called Work Matters, which is appropriate. We again have the launching of the journal today, which is um, Caribbean Social Justice Forum. And of course, we have the book that we are again also launching today. But we also have other things uh, in the pipeline. And in fact, as was mentioned by the director, the call for papers have gone out already. Now, this is just a small taste of what we do here. Uh, a lot of what the college has done has been somewhat quiet, really, as far as I'm concerned. But now we are ready to launch and stage what we do and have it open to scrutiny, public scrutiny, which is the only way, again, that we can really truly engage our stakeholders and contribute something meaningful to all our endeavors. We therefore look forward to continuing to serve our communities, our stakeholders, traditional, new, and future, hopefully a lot more future ones, and expanding the levels and areas of collaboration to better serve the region and keep social dialogue and issues of social justice at the fore of all our activities, be it intellectual, teaching and learning, research, um, community projects, doesn't matter. That's at the core. Coming on towards the end, I, 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 need, to, I need to mention um, for those who will either read the book, purchase the book, or have conversations about the book, that you will realize that six out of 10 of the contributors are actually female. That's important for us, it was always important at the beginning because again, with dialogue, we realized that uh, the majority of the population anyway is female, but also females have contributed significantly to many areas of our lives and to enhancing what we do. And therefore their voices as part of the conversation has to be central, it has to be the core, the focus of what it is that we do. And again, our contributors, um, our females come from Cuba, who's here with us, Dr. Lagardia, we have Barbados. Uh, we have two who have written with me, one in the United Kingdom and one in the United States. And of course, we have Trinidad and Tobago slash Venezuela because she's actually Venezuelan. Um, this is indicative of the openness that we are trying to, to, to cultivate and to continue. And in initiating and continuing dialogue, we have to ensure that all groups, all subgroups, vulnerable groups, uh, privileged groups, really doesn't matter sit down and have conversations on how we move forward. Now, while we are committed to engaging all, all stakeholders and all individuals who are out there who are willing to conversate with us, as I like to say, um, we need to know that even in a male-dominated world, even in a world where we are since small island development states, even in a situation where we're under pressure by COVID and we see what is going on with our infrastructure, with our social systems, with all the myriad of, of, of challenges we have, um, we still have to have a balanced approach at what we do to ensure that we do it the right way. And again, I say once more, open to scrutiny. In closing, I think it's important that we stay committed to engaging in meaningful conversations with everyone whoever those people may be, or whoever those groups may be, in all fora, without the fear of being ostracized, silenced, ignored, or otherwise sidelined by parties who are not as open-minded as we are, but unfortunately sometimes have the ability to exert power within the system to disadvantage uh, the moral, justified, comprehensive, analytical, critical, and intellectual thinking that we are trying to engender here. 
I thank you for your participation in the event and urge you to stay tuned and keep an eye out for all the exciting work that will be coming out of the Cipriani College over the next year and towards the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anatol, for bringing to bear the idea and concept of continued dialogue and growing dialogue and balanced dialogue. Uh, before we close, we do have two presentations to make. So at this time, I would like to invite the Minister of Labor. Minister, would you kindly take center stage for us? We have a presentation for you from Dr. Gertner. <laughs> Your own copy. And we would like to invite our retired ambassador, Dr. Edgell, to center stage. So you may receive your copy. Thank you so much. We would also like at this point to invite our ambassador from actually both of our ambassadors to join us on stage. First, Her Excellency, Sylvia Palmer Miller, we do have a little presentation for you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And if we could have one of our representatives from the Embassy of Colombia to join us on stage, uh, Ms. Cortez. Ms. Cortez is the Chargé d'Affaires at the Embassy of the Republic of Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. At this stage, I would like to say thanks to all of you who have joined us and decided to spend some time with us as the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies is launching the book Contemporary Issues in Caribbean and Latin American Relations. As we are exiting today, I invite you all to go safely. But before you leave, there is a little something for you in the foyer. So books, yes. Yeah, so we do invite you to join us in the foyer before you leave. So thank you again. Thanks to all our panelists, our speakers, and have a very, very good afternoon. Thank you.